Hi, David Blacker with Air Gigs here. Welcome to the first in a series of audio podcast interviews we're going to be having with top session musicians, producers, engineers, and artists. In this first episode, we were so privileged to speak with Ronnie Eads, one of the co-founders of the Muscle Shoals Horn Section. As many of you know, starting in the 60s, the little town of Muscle Shoals, Alabama, became one of the most important recording and production hubs in the entire world. Artists from Aretha to the Stones all cut tracks there. For those that don't know the history of Muscle Shoals, there's a great documentary out on Netflix right now that I highly recommend. It's kind of a must-see for, for music fans. It covers the story of legendary producer and founder of Fame Studios, Rick Hall, and his group of super funky session players who ultimately became responsible for some of the biggest albums of the 20th century. As a founding member of the Muscle Shoals Horns, Ron has worked with some of the biggest names in the business. On a personal level, I really enjoyed our conversation. He's a warm, open individual that shared freely with us on a number of different topics from his early years to his time at Muscle Shoals to working with Rick Hall to key lessons and experiences he's had along the way. He also shares his thoughts and ideas on working remotely here on Air Gigs. The Muscle Shoals Horns, as a unit, were established in 1967. They can be heard on countless hit recordings by top artists such as Bob Dylan, Paul Simon, B.B. King, Bob Seger, James Brown, Roy Orbison, Jimmy Buffett, Fish, the Oak Ridge Boys, Elton John, and many others. They toured with Elton John, Lyle Lovett, and Dobie Gray, and Ron also personally toured with Leonard Skinner. The Muscle Shoals Horns also have three solo recordings out to their name. So I'm really pleased to dive in. Without further ado, please forgive the sound quality of this first interview. It was done via phone, and hopefully we're going to get better as we go, but it's the uh, content that matters, and we're really excited to bring to you Ronnie Eads. So let's jump right in. Thanks so much, Ron, for taking the time to speak with us today. We're really grateful for this opportunity to, uh, to hear a bit of your story. My pleasure, David. Thank you so very much. So why don't we start just sort of at the beginning? Um, you know, there's a lot of ground I'd love to cover with you, but, you know, you I think you grew up relatively close to Muscle Shoals. Is that correct? I did. I grew up in a little town outside of Birmingham, Alabama, called Tarrant City, a little small place. And I stayed there uh, in school. I played... Uh, Sachs, my uh, grandparents raised me and my brother, and um, they bought me a saxophone because I always knew I wanted to do music. From the time I was a little bitty, I'd run around. They had an old piano in the house. I'd run around banging on that old piano and uh, banging on furniture, you know, just had a lot of energy and everything. So they said, man, we got to do something with this guy. So they bought me a, a saxophone, a soprano saxophone, and I played soprano saxophone from um, the time they had a band, I think I started when I was 10 years old, playing in the uh, school band, and then concert season, I started playing uh, oboe, and I was still in grammar school, and they moved me up to the high school band, because uh, I knew that was all I wanted to do. I made passing grades and everything, but... Uh, Music, I made A plus, A pluses all the way through school. That's I knew that's what I wanted to do eventually. That was there. That was one of my questions. Was, was it always a focus? And it sounds like from the earliest time you could remember, you knew music was for you. And oh, I knew it. Were you listening? Like, was it were as you were evolving as a player? Was it was it the instrument itself that captivated you, or was it like? the sounds that you were hearing coming out at the time or a little of both or what was, what was firing you up to stay excited and playing? Um, well, it was a, a little of both. And in school, when I went to school, you know, I wanted to join the band and they had an opening for a saxophone player, you know, and I want to play something. I said, Hey, that's me. I'll take that opening. I'll uh, fit in there. You know how it used to be years and years ago. They only had so many instruments. Sure. And, uh, a sax was what they had, and then later on, my parents got, I mean, my grandparents got me one. But, uh, and then also another thing to add to that, um, I had asthma when I was small, 
And the doctor said, you know, possibly a woodwind instrument would help with that asthma. And I understand that Pete Fountain had the same thing when he uh, started playing clarinet. And uh, it really did help. So, uh, you know, the combination of those two. Oh, that's really interesting. And then, like, did you start to cue cue in on certain, like, musical influences um, in your form, you know, when you were just starting playing off that you were trying to emulate, or did that come a little later? Well, that sort of came a little later, but I liked uh, an old saxophone player called Phil Austin and um, Ace Cannon and um, uh, head out Yakety Sack, Boots Randolph. I liked all those guys. King Curtis, yeah, those were, oh, they were excellent players. I said, man, man. So I would study them to see what they did. And then I would try to, uh, you know, copy some things. But at the same time, I wanted to be who I am. You know, I wanted to be me. So from a really, like, early sense on, like a lot of players, as you evolve as a musician, that's sort of the end of the, the road. You know, you go through learning uh, to copy all these other players, and then you kind of come around to saying, okay, well, what am I going to say now? But it sounds like from an a, a early stage on you kind of had a sense that you wanted to have your own sound and, and style correct because you know you can only do something don't nobody want two boots randolphs or anybody else right know? and i said i understand what they're doing I, co- I copied them i played what they did and i said if i'm going to really and i set goals you know i always wanted to be a studio musician and uh, you know do gigs with uh different artists famous artist and I said if I'm gonna do that I got to get in this gap some kind of way because they can hire anybody I've got to do something a little bit different than what they're doing so I believe I was successful in doing that were were you very yeah definitely were you very disciplined about it when you were early on and spent a lot of hours practicing or or did that come just over time more well uh that's all I was really interested in sometimes and I, you know, don't want to influence any kids, but I would skip school and go out to the band room, and they knew exactly where I was, and they'd come out there and get me. But uh, I would rehearse sometime, um, practice eight hours a day, especially wow. after I got out of school. I disciplined myself because, you know, if you're going to be good, you got to practice at it. It don't come by just, you know, saying, well, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. No, you got to work at it. Anything in life, you got to work hard at it to achieve what you want to achieve. And were you following some kind of practice regiment or were you developing it yourself? Did you just sort of, you know what I'm saying? Like, did, how did you know what to, to focus on as a player? Well, and what I focused on was the better basic principles of music. Uh, I would focus on my scales and uh, I was taught that if you want to learn how to play a fast piece, then you've got to start out slow. Right. And, you know, the better basic fundamentals, and I still do that today. You can't, you know, you can't get rid of them. They're there. Right. And the more you practice and the more you hold your notes and your tuning and, you know, running up and down your scales and all, you can't beat it. Absolutely. And so did you receive formal Training, or was it self-taught, or a little of both? Well, it was a little of both. I went to uh, high school, and then I took a correspondence course from Berkeley. And then after we formed the horn section, these guys were all music majors. So I learned everything from them. If they did something or wrote something, I'd say, hey, wait a minute. You know, what is this? Why did you do this? And everything. I was very curious and interested and uh to me i got that college education free from uh college majors gotcha yeah from the best source (laughs) from being in that incredible environment you know where you you know i mean there's no better education right than that Um, yeah i didn't have i didn't have to go to class because i was over at their house (laughs) yeah exactly (laughs) exactly so that that's interesting so when you first got to muscle shoals did you feel like you were like bring it on like I'm ready for this or did you feel in a sense like I got to 
catch up or I got, you know, where were you sort of when you first arrived? And is that well, when I, yeah, we, uh, when I arrived, um, Barry Beckett, which was a producer and he was a keyboard player and he moved to Muscle Shows ahead of me. And recall at the time was uh, using the Memphis horns and he said they were charging him triple scale to come down to Alabama and uh, he was sort of tired of it. So, uh, uh, I had already been to Muscle Shows and uh, met everybody. We did uh, I'm Your Puppet with James and Bobby Purify. And so Barry called me up and said, come on up here. Rick wants to do a horn, you know, put a horn section together. And, uh, David, I was really nervous because, uh, you know, but that was my goal. I said, man, I've got to strike out and i got to do this. I moved to Muscle Shows with uh, family making $15 a week uh, playing at a, a private club. And I, I would go down to the studio every day and sit and wait. I said, one of these days I'm going to go get in here because I wasn't doing anything else, you know, at the time anyway. And uh, finally my opportunity came, and I played uh, tenor on a couple of songs. And uh, Rick said, man, we really need a, a Barry player. And I said, hey, I'm it. You know, cause I said, what a way to get in. So I went and bought me a baritone. A con with a low A on it, and I started, uh, you know, playing on the sessions and everything. Well, that's great. So you just showed up every day, just <laughs> ready, ready to play, ready for them to put you in, and 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 waited until the opportunity arose. I did. I said, y'all gonna have to run me off, run me out of here, but I'm <laughs> here. I'm sticking like glue. Y'all gonna have to use me or give me a job custodian or what? Because I'm here. And I think that really helped Rick saw that, that I was, uh, you know, ready to play and enthusiastic and would give it all I had. That's right. That's right. And so that's obviously going to shine through when someone comes every day, you know, regardless of whether they're, they're you know, <laughs> on the session or not. They're just showing up. That, that shows a lot of intent, you know, and, and seriousness. So did you move with – you said you moved with your family or you moved when you were – uh, alone? Were you just well, you when you moved to Muscle Shoals? Well, when I first started, I moved up and stayed with Barry for about three months, and then I moved the family on up. And I did have another job. I was working for Orkin, um, terminating houses and inspecting houses, and then I worked for a company called Seagoing Boats. And uh, the guy at the Seagoing Boats, I worked there for about a month, you know, until I could fit in and get in the sessions. And they always say way back when that you had to pay your dues. You know, if you wanted to do something, you had to pay them. So I was sticking at the studio and working some. And uh, then the guy at the boat place said, well, you got to make up your mind. you got to either play music or you got to uh, work here. And I said, well, go get my check ready. I'm out of here. So oh, that's, when I, that's when I started staying at the studio every day. That's great. That's great. And then, so how how long after that before you started to feel like, okay, this is stable now? Now we're really, I guess, was that the pre sixty seven when the horns formed, or was that just around the same same time when you were going in every day to the studio like that? It was uh, pre Muscle Shows horns. I was there with another horn player and uh, doing sessions, playing tenor until I got my Barry, and uh, we were. Part, Rick asked me to sign on with uh, Fame. So I signed on with Fame, and we were down there every day either writing or, you know, coming up with different things. So that let me know that I was pretty well secure in that. And uh, we had a group called the Fame Gang. Sure. So I, I had joined the Fame Gang. That was pre-Muscle Shells Horns. And so at that and point, we, you you had kind of, that that would meant steady paycheck and you could focus solely on music at that point. Right? Exactly. Yeah, he paid us a salary. Wasn't much, but at least it was a salary. It was enough to live off on. And uh, that gave me really, really good experience there. I think you had a question about Rick Hall. Yeah, I and, did. I, I was just curious, like, what it was like to work with him and how his input contributed to, to you know, the overall parts and, and, you know, any reflections you have on, on what it was like working with him? Oh, yeah. Well, Rick, when when I first got there, you know, I was hungry and uh, gung-ho. And uh, Rick would come up 
uh, with most all the horn lines. We might work on a song for, you know, two or three weeks or a month or whatever. He would hum this, say, all right, go put that on. And we'd do it, and we worked sometime all day long on a thing with the horns after he'd done the rhythm section. We overdubbed on it. And uh, I said, man, I was getting frustrated. I said, I don't think this guy knows what he's doing. <laughs> but then later in years, you know, I look back, and I said, man, he knew exactly what he was doing because, David, when I first got up there, uh, everything that was coming out of there, I mean, everything was a hit record. And I'm, I'm looking back today, I said, man, what an idiot. I thought he was, you know, didn't know what he was doing, but he knew exactly what he was doing. He's an incredible man and an incredible producer. And uh, he helped us out so much. He would uh, show us, you know, where to play and what to play. And, uh, you know, he taught us, and I can say this, you might have another question later on, but um, he taught us that we, you know, to be a session musician, you've got to be very, very creative. You can't just uh, see a piece of music and play it because that's somebody else's creation. That's not yours. So studio work, we were overdubbing. We had to come up with the licks. And uh, he would show us the places to play. Here's what we want to play. Don't get on the artist. And uh, keep it simple, stupid. We worked on the KISS principle. Right. He Keep it simple, stupid. And uh, he said, don't play everything you know in 30 seconds. So, uh, you know, we kept it simple and uh, very tasteful. And uh, I learned then that uh, in order to be a session musician, you've got to become part of that song. You can't just hear it and say, oh, okay, I'll put this here. No, you got to listen to it. The uh, Nine times out of ten, the rhythm track has been done. And um, they have a pilot vocal from the artist on there. You've got to listen to see what he or she is trying to convey in this song. And then you've got to come up with uh, your creative ideas to put in there to complement. You never take away from what the artist is doing and keep it simple. And keep that cadence going. You know, if it's a slow song, keep it slow. And if it's a fast song, then you can put your licks in there. But uh, you've got to listen and become part of what is going on with that particular song. That's really valuable, I'm sure, for a lot of our listeners here. And, and was there a moment for you, like, where that clicked? Because you can't necessarily teach that to somebody. It's almost like teaching listening to somebody. You know, you can't uh, teach them how to listen. They kind of got to learn to listen. And, and uh, so I was just curious if there was a, a moment where at first you were stumbling and then suddenly it sort of clicked, or was that more an evolution? No, no. It, it was uh, a stumbling for a while. First yeah. thing I did, I think, was with Clarence Carter when we did Patches. And, uh, you know, we were sort of stumbling around. But after a while, you know, you, you get it. It takes a while for musicians, I guess, because I was hard-headed to know. And once the lights came on, it took about a year or so for me to understand what was going on when you're cutting hit records. You know, I could be creative, but then we could say, oh, no, he said, that's the wrong idea, wrong idea. And I said, oh, it sounds good to me, you know. Yeah. And he said, no, let's try this here. Let's do this here. And I always said, okay, now you got to tell me why you want that there. And he would tell me, you know, he said, because it fits in. Listen to what the lines are right here when you did that. I said, oh, okay, I got it now. And uh, after, you know, years working with Rick, it just sort of became a a thing. He really gave everybody that uh, was musicians down there, um, you know, a college education on music, on engineering, on producing, on everything. Where did it come from for him? Do you know? I'm just curious. I think I think he was a guitar player, but uh, I think he was just uh, – uh, wanting to produce records, so he started the uh, Florence, Alabama uh, Music Enterprises, him and another guy. And uh, they just wanted to, uh, you know, cut records. There was some good artists down there, Arthur Alexander and some of the uh, Jimmy Hughes, uh, some of the black artists. And uh, I think that's when he first, you know, got started. He wanted to start producing records. And uh, for somebody, you know, to do that when you had Nashville going good, you had New York going good, Chicago going good, and then you got a little bitty town 
they hadn't got nothing but cotton pickers and farmers and everything else attracting these long-haired hippie musicians <laughs> in there. You know, but he knew what he wanted to do, and uh, and he did it. And, uh, you know, you, you don't really know exactly what's going on when you're there, but after a few years, you get to looking back, and you see this, how impressive that he was, and uh, every musician that worked for Rick went on to do incredible things. You know, he had about three sets of musicians, and I came in on the second set, and, uh, man, what an experience, you know. And then, uh, um, if you don't mind, I'll go into something else. Uh, Jimmy Johnson, Barry Beckett, David Hood, and uh, Roger Hawkins uh, called themselves the Swampers. Leonard Skinner named them that, the Swampers. And uh, they moved on over and bought a building in Sheffield and started uh, recording with uh, uh, Jerry Wexler with Atlantic Records. And I think uh, Rick and uh, Jerry had sort of a falling out. And uh, so they started that group. And uh, after our contract ran out with uh, Capital with the Muscle Shows Horns, then we uh, started freelancing. And uh, Lord have mercy, we started working everywhere. Memphis, Nashville was up there two, three times a week. Uh, New York, L.A., uh, Philadelphia, just, just anywhere we could go, you know. That was one. Of, I was I, I was curious if you you guys were bouncing back and forth between Muscle Shoals Sound and Fame, and I guess that's the answer to that question for sure. You were, yeah. Uh, we did, but uh, at the time, I think uh, uh, Jimmy and him got a little upset with us because we didn't know they were moving, and then Rick got us to sign another contract. I think Capital United Artists, one of those, and we couldn't do anything until that contract ran out, and when it did. Then uh, we had done, you know, quite a few hits with Rick. And um, so we decided, we said, well, we're going to take a chance, guys, because this is do or die. And uh, so we uh, went out on our own, started freelancing, calling people up and, uh, you know, doing sessions all over. It took a while, but uh, we finally we, we made a success out of it. Now, at, as your success was growing, uh, per, you know, professionally, how was it? Were you personally? Were you? Was life good? I mean, were you were you enjoying the the ride, or were, was it was it a sort of a mixed bag of stuff? Like I guess life is in a lot of ways. But I'm just curious how it was for you personally as your success was kind of taken off. Oh well, it was uh, successful, but at the same time we had our uh, downfalls. The horn section got along great. We got along with all the musicians, but. Uh, uh, I don't know whether you're sort of implying uh, drugs and so forth. Yeah, you know, I don't. I, don't I, I had read in another interview it, 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 it had a bit of a struggle with drugs at the time, and I didn't know if you know you wanted to share anything about that or or not. Uh, you know, oh, but, oh yeah, I do uh, outreaches now. You know, Christian outreaches on kids. I said, all right, you want to do this? Here's what's going to happen to you, you know, right down the road. But people are so hard-headed. I was. I didn't listen to anybody. And uh, during the session, I would smoke three, four packs of cigarettes a day. And uh, at the highlight of our, you know, time playing together and doing sessions, I never thought the money was going to run out. Um, I didn't shoot up, but I did uh, all kind of pot and uh, a little coke. But, uh, you know, we didn't do much when we were doing sessions, but after the sessions, boy, we get loaded up. So, uh, oh, uh, yeah, it was, you know, the life of wine, women, and song. I don't know who wrote that, but that's the truth with a musician. Right. I'm gonna tell you. Right, because, so, I mean, it's a, it's a lot of intensity, too. Like, you have these, you know, powerful, intense sessions that you're up, you know, working on, and then it drops off, I imagine. So there's these kind of fluctuations like that. Yeah, there is a lot of adrenaline when you're doing a session. Uh, I wouldn't say you're nervous, but, you know, the different artists that you work with, you have to get that adrenaline going. You have to, get, you know, get pumped up, as they would say. So, uh, you know, I try drugs, pills, or whatever, get pumped up so, you know, we could really be on top of our game. But uh, we thought we were on top of our game. But when you're doing drugs and alcohol, you're not on top of nothing. Right. So you're you're ruining your health. And uh, I ruined my health, uh, David, if I might go ahead and explain a little bit about that. Sure. Um, 
1979, we had just got back from Paris, France, with uh, the Pointer Sisters, uh, uh, Jimmy Holiday, and uh, another guy. I can't think of his name. And I was having a hard time breathing. I couldn't breathe because, you know, the smoking and the drugs and all of that, I knew how to play, still had to know how how to play. But uh, I couldn't breathe. I would have to come home and do it, get on a breathing machine and go back and try to finish this session like that. And, uh, man, it was so, so tough. And uh, if I may get into a spirit, spiritual experience at this time, sure. Um, my daughter at 17, she said, Daddy, you need Jesus. I said, I need what? You know, and I'd cuss her, cuss her God, and get me another Budweiser out of the fridge, and I'd be going to town. But, uh, you know, I went to the doctor, and he said, Mr. Ease, I'm going to tell you something. He said, you're not going to like this. But he said, you're wasting your money and my time. He said, from these x-rays, he said, you've got emphysema. He said, you've had asthma all your life. He said, that's good for horn players. Because he just told me straight. He said, uh, I would say at this time, I said, that uh, you ain't got time long to live. He said, you have destroyed your body. And how, how, how old were you then at, at that age? I that think I was, I think I was 39. 39, okay. Wow. Mm-hmm. And so my daughter kept on getting me to go to church. So finally I did, and I'll make this all short. And after about six or eight weeks, you know, the pastor was there, and I just couldn't stand it. And I just went running up to the altar and said, all right, Lord, here I am. What's left of it? You can have it because I have destroyed it. There's nothing left. And, uh, you know, after that, so many months, um, I had to go back and get checkups. And I I threw them cigarettes away, lighter and everything, after I walked out the door. And uh, so God healed me. I had a hole in my eardrum. God healed me of that. And God also healed me of emphysema. I still have asthma that I fight every now and then, but I think if I didn't have the asthma that I wouldn't remember what God had done, you know. And uh, sure. so now I'm not, I'm not on any medication whatsoever. My wife has got me on a strict diet. And uh, I feel like I was 50 years old again. Oh, that's fantastic! And and did did you did you feel when you had that experience that you had to put music away? And did you put music away, or did you just um, what what was the relationship with music? At you know when you kind of came to that moment or I, crossroads? I did put it away, and the horn section. Uh, I said, man, you can't quit us, man. You know, I said, guys, I got I got you know, leave this alone. I got to get away from it. Yeah. And I, I just, uh, you know, read my Bible and seek the Lord and had to just, you know, quit playing with the horns for a while. And they were all looking in the Bible trying to find out how I can come back and play with them. You know, I said, keep uh, reading, boys, keep reading. <laughs> and, uh, but I had to give it up. And, uh, the day after I got saved, this is, uh, unreal here, Ronnie Millsap called because I had done a session with Ronnie. Uh, in Nashville called No Getting Over Me, that song that he had out, I think it was a million seller. And uh, Ronnie called me, and I had to do a session in Nashville, you know, that day, right after I got saved. I hadn't quit yet, but I was, right after I got saved. So uh, I was in Nashville doing a thing, and he said, can you come out here and do uh, the Johnny Carson show? And I said, well, I'm, I'm booked on Monday. And uh, then he called me back about an hour later. He said, I made a mistake. It's on Tuesday. Can I fly you out Monday night? I said, yeah, okay. So he flew me out, and I did a tonight show with him. On uh, He wanted the whole band that did no getting over me. It's the first time he'd been on there, and I think he had a meeting seller on that thing. And right after that, I just sort of gave it up. You know, I said, this is not for me. Uh, and I got in a cab after I flew to New York, after I flew to L.A., going to uh, – you know, NBC, where Johnny Carson was filmed. And I had quit drinking, and the first thing the cab driver did was hand me a joint. And wow. I just had got saved the day before on Sunday. And I said, now, look at this. The devil ain't trying to tempt me. I don't know what's going <laughs> on here. But I said, nah, buddy. I said, just get me to the studio. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not I don't want that. And so was that a, a clear cutoff? Like you, you after that, after that Johnny Carson session, there were you just did you did you were you still living in Muscle Shoals at that time, or did you 
Um, yeah, I was. I was still it, there. And uh, the horn section, you know, because I was sort of crazy anyhow, you know, cutting up and doing this and that. They yeah. thought it was just something else I was doing. They said, well, he'll get over this kick, this phase of his life, or this kick in a while. So uh, they brought me a case of beer over there. They said, here, drink this. You'll be back to normal. <laughs> <laughs> so tabbing back to, to the Muscle Shoals uh, time, are there any sessions that stuck out for you that, were sort of changed you or your approach to playing? Were there any ones that, like, had such a real big impact on you? Well, there was uh, a lot. I like to work with Clarence Carter, but uh, um, really I can't single out any particular one because every one of them was different. I really enjoyed playing every one of them. Sometimes we'd have a hard time with an artist, but uh, not too much. And uh, I remember working with Liza Minnelli. She was incredible. And uh, Clarence Carter. And uh, one thing that sticks out in my mind, when we did a session with Aretha Franklin, that was back in the, uh, I guess, maybe 70, 60-something, late 60s and early 70s. She came in the studio. And uh, at Rick's, Rick Hall produced, uh, with Jerry Wexler was there, and uh, Rick, Rick produced it. And um, she came in, and she had a song, and she sat down just by herself at the piano and started playing. And, man, I got cold chills all over me. I said, honey, you don't need nothing but you and your piano. (laughs) You don't need nobody else. She was just unbelievably awesome. And then uh, we worked worked some things with uh, Joe Tex. I don't know if you remember Joe Tex, probably. Um, ain't gonna bump no more and no be fat woman. Joe was incredible to work with. He was so uh cutting up all the time and he had some ornaments. He said, Guys, let's try this. And all most all the producers and everything artists that we work with, we try to get you relaxed, you know. And uh they would make you feel like you were all family. This lad ever out of Nashville, he was really easy going, he knew what to do. And then we had Mickey Buckins and Steve Melton. And Jimmy Johnson, of course, in Muscle Shoals, and uh, Ernie Winfrey in Nashville. These guys, uh, and Jerry Masters, and of course Rick Hall, uh, you know, you can put your horn down without any kind of reverb or echo or anything else. It sounds horrible to me. I don't even like to hear myself play. Right. But they, they would take this and do whatever that it took to get you sounding really good. You know, EQs and maybe double it. <coughs> And, uh, you know, just add different things to it to where sometimes I'd go in there and listen. I said, are you sure I did this? You know, and they changed <laughs> some things around. But I said, hey, okay, I'll just put some things down. Y'all put it where you want it. I was going to say, did you kind of come up with a little recording setup that you had a little go-to sound that you um, would replicate a lot or the engineers would replicate or, or did was it different every time? Was there different mics, different positioning yeah, we would use different mics, but I, um, when I was first getting into recording, I, I would like, you know, try to change different mouthpieces around. And uh, now I'm using a Stryphon. It was made in West Germany. I think they're out of business. They went to the Zimmer. But uh, on the Barry, the thing that I would do on the Barry that uh, I think set me apart, because they still hadn't been able to copy it yet, is, uh, you know, back then they had... Um, when you did a recording, it would add bass to it automatically, way back when on the old vinyls. And so I listened to that, and every Barry player I heard sounded uh, sort of on the muddy side. And I said, wait a minute, this ain't going to work. So what I did, I tried out some mouthpieces, and I found a Berg Larson 100 over 1 metal mouthpiece that had some bite to it. And, uh, you know, doing these fast passages and all, I would use that mouthpiece on the old microphone, the broadcast microphone, a DX77. And I'd take one of those around. And, uh, man, that thing just would cut through, but it still had the very basic, basic sound to it, like a Barry Sachs. But it would cut through. And I think that was, uh, you know, the difference on my plan and a lot of, you know, other players. So, it, yeah, it cut, it, it cut out a lot of those sort of muddy uh muddy frequencies and it had a much more presence to it 
Yes, it did, yeah. yeah. It had, uh, you know, a little, on the uh, high side, a teeny kind of sound, but it would, uh, when the recording came out, it had that bass sound to it. But uh, it cut through really, really nice. So, And I still do that. So, so what are you doing these days? I, I know you're you're still involved with music, right? In, in where you're. I from. am. Can you tell us yeah, a little I'm, bit about that? I'm still involved. I've been doing a few sessions in Nashville, and I did a couple of sessions down in Muscle Shoals not too long ago. And uh, February the 26th, our horn section was inducted into the Alabama Music Hall of Fame which was a thrill. We didn't know whether we were going to make it before we passed away or not. But the the lady from the Hall of Fame called me, and she said, Ron, I just want to let you know that this year y'all are on the list with uh, 76 others. I said, with what? 76 others? I said, man, we ain't never getting in there. <laughs> we're, going to be, we're going to be dead and gone 100 years before we get in there. But then she called me back and she said, well, y'all are in the top 10. I said, oh, okay, great. So then she called me back and she said, well, y'all are in. She said, you're one of six people that are going to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. It was uh, us and then uh, uh, Donna Jean Gosha with the Grateful Dead. And uh, let's see, three more. Wet Wheelie was uh, inducted and uh, producer Johnny Sandlin. Amazing producer from Muscle Shells. So uh, we went down and played for that, and I think it, they had it broadcast on uh, Alabama Public Television about three weeks ago. Oh, that's fantastic! That's fantastic. Um, and what I'm doing, what I'm doing now, I'm doing my uh, own work here at my house. Uh, a friend of mine, keyboard player, actually knows computers better than I do. He uh, lives here in town. He records tracks. We will collaborate together on the tracks and then he'll send the track here to my house and uh, by wave file and I'll listen to it and critique it and we make our changes and then uh, I'll add my horn to it and then we'll add the reverb and everything we've got three or four songs done now we're working on two albums uh, I'm doing the old spiritual standards that hadn't been done in years and years and then we're going to be working on a Christmas album Oh, fantastic! And so you, because I know you've done some air gig sessions. So what what is you, what do you have there at home in terms of your home studio setup? Well, I've got a Bose speaker system that I'm using. I really like it, and then a uh, you know regular uh, monitor, and I'm using the Audio Box um, USB from Personas and all the Personas uh, software. Okay, great, great. And it has, has all the, uh, you know, anything you want. They come out with something new. I've got to add uh, another 3.2 that just came out from them. And uh, incredible stuff. I really like it. It sounds great. It's clean. And, uh, you know, I can do anything Nashville can do. I think the record companies are sort of going out of business because everybody's got you know, things that they can do at home, just like air digs. I love air digs. I don't have to well, go to the studio. don't have to drive to Nashville. I can do it here at home. Well, you know, I mean, this is such an opportunity, obviously, for anyone who's listening to, you know, work with a talent such as Ron. I mean, that's why we're doing this interview is to get people to realize that, you know, that there's like world-class talent out there with home studios who are who are excited to work. And, you know, it's not necessarily – how you record live, you know, you, ideally you record live in a room with folks, but I mean, overdubs are the nature of recording too. So, you know, when you have these great options, um, you know, like working with someone like yourself, we, we want people to know about it for sure. Um, right. And I really enjoy it because you're not stressed. You're here at home and uh, you can concentrate on what the artist is doing. That's what I like to do. I'll listen to the song over and over and over again because I think we have 10 days to do it or so. And I listen to it for three days. I don't just go in and start, you know, laying down something. I want to see, you know, what, what's he trying to do here? What's he saying or what she's saying? How can I compliment? So I'll do a little snippet, you know, and send it. And then, uh, you know, I'll finish the song off. And i see if you got any ideas, let me know. And we can go back and redo it real quick. And then it don't take long. 
one thing that I might say, but you've got iTunes and all this other kind of stuff, if Air Geese could develop a way for these artists, up-and-coming artists, you know, to display their songs after they get it done, <clears throat> you know, with all the professional artists, because they're, you know, quality, top quality things, and there's a lot of singers out there that, you know, can't really afford to do a session in Nashville or so, but they've got access to some of the finest musicians in the world. And, uh, you know, so uh, I'm thrilled about it. The keyboard player that I'm working with now, he told me about it. And I said, what? I ain't never heard of that. So uh, we got on there. I said, man, I love this. This That's is wonderful. Great. That's great. So uh, I'm tickled with it, David. I'm just, you know, beside myself. I just... I said, I'd play at a bank robbery if I knew who, you know, when it would be. So, uh, you know, people need a good horn player, call me. All Uh, right, well, you know, send me some. I'm ready. I'm sitting here ready to go. All right, well, people hear that because this is a serious talent, ready and and willing to work on your songs. And don't take, you know, the, the access is just, it's sort of unprecedented. So we hope people recognize that. So I guess, you know, in conclusion, I guess the one one question I kind of was thinking about, and maybe you answered it with your, with Rick Hall being the sort of source of the creative mojo or whatever, but, you know, there's an element of magic, I guess, for lack of a better word, that goes into great recordings, right? Something that you can't break apart. You can't, you can't, there's no formula. It's, it's larger than the sum of its parts. And when I think about all the incredible music that came out of, you know, where you were in Muscle Shoals, it's kind of, it's it's almost hard for one to wrap their head around how that happened, you know, or, or and, and since you were at the heart of it all, I just wondered if you had any insights or as to what sets the stage, you know, if there is such a thing, maybe, maybe the answer is it just happened because it happened and you, you can't take anything from that. It just happened. But is there any insights for people who want to make great recordings that you picked up that you might, pass along that you know was was it all just the genius of this one man coming down or largely or are there ways that other artists can set the stage or or take something from that experience does that make sense yeah well um it was rick you know was the first one that seemed to do that but then you had muscle show sound and you had uh, all the guys that moved from uh muscle shows to nashville that did incredible too and uh they say that muscle shows that the uh that it must have been in the water because it was the funkiest place that you could cut a record back then. Percy Sledge, when a man loves a woman, you know, I thought, Alexander, you better move on. Everybody thought the musicians were black, but uh, uh all the musicians were white and they were just funky. And uh we had uh Tom Dowd from Atlantic Records come down. And uh, he showed us, he said, I'm going to show y'all what you're doing so you know what you're doing. And he would uh, have a chalkboard. And if you can imagine this, he would put, uh, you know, a beat. He said, this is one beat. And he'd draw a big old chalkboard. And he said, you can be on the back of the beat without dragging, or you can be at the top of the beat without rushing. He said, you guys, funky players, are on the back of the beat. And I think, you know, to me that that really helped us because when you hear, you know, blues and everything, uh, you sort of want more. So we didn't put everything we knew into these sessions. We leave the people wanting more. And they'll listen to that song over and over again. That is something to reflect on because that's not something you can explain to somebody how to do that. They have to find that in the playing, you know, through experience as such. Right. so, keeping, that, keep, keeping that simplicity and leave them, work, work, you know, wanting more. Because people would tell Rick or Jimmy Johnson or some of the guys up in Nashville, man, if you put this here, this would be great, you know. And they wanted to overcrowd the record, overcrowd what you were doing. And, uh, you know, I always tell people, don't do that. Leave them wanting more. Don't put everything in there. You know, it might sound good. Hey, this fits good, but it might not, you know, are they going to buy it? Do they want right. to hear it again? You know, you got to ask yourself that. Well, what have I done here? You know, 
And we used to take hit records and put it on a frequency analyzer when we were doing our three albums just to see what people were doing. You know, well, how hot how, how they have, do they have this bass? And uh, how hot are the drums? You know, the engineers are most incredible people. I love working with them because they can, you know, listen and bring this out. It takes, you know, a whole family of people to put out a record. And uh, they can either boost the drum up a little bit, you know, to make it feel a little better to, uh, you know, I guess beat on your chest a little bit or so. And on how hot your instruments are, the frequencies and everything else, it's sort of a science now that they can do. But, uh, you know, you, we pay attention to everything that we do. Well, why are you doing this? You know, there's a question. Do you know why you're doing this? Do you know why the drums are hotter than the vocals sometimes? You know, they put the vocal down. And, uh, you know, it just depends. Well, I, I like what you said. It does take a, a whole family to, to produce an album, and it's all that collective effort and energy that ultimately res, results in the final product. So it, it's a lot about who you're working with, too, you know, putting together the right people. And, exactly. Uh, yeah, but all the Muscle Shows musicians, we were all family. The rhythm section and the horn section, we got along. We partied together. We did everything together. And, uh, you know, when you go in the studio, you relax. It was just like going in there with a big, big family. And, uh, to us, the, uh, tracks make a lot of difference. We can come up with different things, but if you don't have a good, solid foundation track, everything starts with that foundation with the drums, bass, guitar, piano. If you don't have a really, really solid, you know, foundation and you don't have anything to build on. Just like anything else, you build in a building, you're going to have a good foundation. So those guys and, you know, the Nashville guys, man, they laid down the foundation. It was just sort of a piece of cake to us because we're just going in and put the ice and all. Now, on occasion, we would uh, do charts, and uh, we had charts on, you know, quite a few sessions. But to me, uh, when you have the charts and you're reading the music, and that takes away, to me, from the feel that you put on that record. If you just come up with it and you go out in the studio and you play it, you're not concentrating on, you know, doing perfect on the chart where you don't have to go back and over the overdub and do this and do that. Um, I like it when we just got it in our head and we laid it down. That way you can put your creative ability in there, in that song. It's not something that you read or somebody else has written that you're reading. And uh, even today, I've heard uh, some sessions, you know, that were done. And uh, I told my wife, I said, Pam, there's no feel here. Listen, there's nothing. They're reading it. There's nothing there. There's no feel there. I would not buy this. So I like to have that feel there. And the whole records way back when, um, and they were so perfect. But uh, nowadays, I don't know about today's music. I have uh, <laughs> reservations on that, you know. So they just they're just in there all these synthesizers and everything else that they're using. I say they need to go back to the better basic old time players. Them old players they could play. Oh yeah, oh yeah, and I th I think that's sort of the, the the magic of Muscle Shoals. It was no one, you know, it was, it was guys who were really honoring the song and and playing understated and 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 came you know, and these amazing things came out of that, you know, in, in such a way that. A lot of times people who are shooting for the flashy or, you know, what they miss the point, you know, in that sense. So um, I think that legacy is, is, is something to study and something to think about, you know, for sure. It, it, is, and it might be in the water. I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> might we had, I can remember we had uh, that the horns had played on five, five songs in the top ten at one time. And I said, man, this is incredible. But, uh, you know, it takes time. You just don't go in and do a three-hour session and hope for the best and put it out and whatever. Uh, Rick took his time, Jimmy and all the guys down in Muscle Shows. We took our time. It might take, you know, two weeks to do a, a song or a month. I remember Rick would take, uh, I don't know, some of it was two months or three months, and he'd come back, hey, guys, we got to change this. And I said, do what? That's a long time ago. But when he got it right or, you know, Gene and the rest of them, put it out, hit record. 
every time. It's amazing. It was just so amazing. You know, once you put it out, it's out. So I guess in a sense, you know, if you have the luxury to take your time, you might as well get it the way you want it sounded, you know, get it sounding right. And those guys were, I guess, masters at that, knowing what they want and taking their time to, to get it right, you know. Exactly. So. Rick said, if I'm going to fight, you know, all of this, uh, all these record companies, he said, man, we got to come out of here with some records. And, uh, boy, he did. All of them down there. Every musician went on to do something great, most of them, out of Muscle Shows. Most incredible place I've ever been in. Well, I can't tell you how much we appreciate your sharing this experience with us, and I think that it's been super valuable for for all of our listeners and community of, like, session musicians and engineers and producers. And, you know, this is all really valuable stuff and information and and, uh, and we really appreciate you sharing a bit of your story. Is there anything you want to leave folks with or a last thought or anything like that or a few albums you'd take on a desert island or how would you, uh, you know, want to lead us out here? Well, just uh, get on air gigs and send me some work. <laughs> Sweet. I love it. So, I love it. All, all right. I well, say and uh, thank you, David. You've been just Incredible. You know how to pull things out of people. So that's great. I love right. that. And I, I really thank Air Gigs. And it's really, uh, really a blessing to me. So I'm well, glad, I'm glad to find out about it and glad I'm with you. All right. We're honored to have you. And thank you so much. You know, uh, hopefully I didn't pull too hard. And hopefully. Oh, no. If you, okay. if you need, if you need anything else and I might know it, don't hesitate to call me. All right. Thanks so much, Ronnie, and uh, thanks again, everybody, and we'll be back next time.